Our keynote speaker for lunch today is Dan Lopez, Vice President of Technology at EarthCast. He currently heads the building of EarthCast platform and web presence, focusing his digital cloud and engineering expertise on building products that are modern and open to democratize technologies with the aim of creating new markets. Please welcome Mr. Dan Lopez.
jump off the ISS and commercialize this stuff. And so what we have done just recently is we raised uh, a staggering $100 million uh, to acquire uh, Deimos Imaging. Deimos Imaging has two satellites. One is a 20-meter uh, RG NIR, which is red, green, and NIR. Uh, and the other one is a full RGB NIR um, and a pan band camera called uh, Deimos 2. That is a 70-centimeter uh, satellite. So we can see some really awesome stuff on the ground. By doing a transaction to acquire Deimos, we became the anchor tenant of an organization called Pangeo Alliance. Anyone know what Pangeo Alliance is? Awesome. Now I can actually tell you something you don't know. Uh, Pangeo Alliance is the Star Alliance for EO. Um, it is a bunch of guys who have centers that if I can't fulfill an order, I can go call someone else, they can fulfill their order, and it becomes a bigger uh, 1 plus 1 equals 3 type organization for cross queuing, cross um, tasking uh, between the constellations. So the virtual constellation is cool. With that acquisition, this is uh, some sample imagery of uh, June and February of, um, I August and February of uh, New York City. The agile, the agility uh, capabilities of Deimos 2 allow us to take on Nader or um, off Nader. This is an off Nader uh, image that you can start looking at creating this stuff over them and doing some really fascinating stuff with not only um, looking at situational awareness or things like that, but you can use this stuff with big data um, applications and look at what's happening with macroeconomic indicators, things like that. So this is a uh, video we took, um, our imagery, and we compiled it. It's running on our, our home page. If you go to earthgas.com, you can see um, our imagery. And this is a lot of it. It's five meter resolution, beautiful imagery we've been taking in the last uh, 18 months. You can see the Nile River. Um, as in really fascinating places on the planet starting to come to life. What's interesting here is that EarthCast is always built around a series of models, not just taking data down and selling it to traditional EO guys, but we want to do something much more rich, more powerful, evocative for the general public. Um, you look at Algeria, you look at uh, places like uh, Belgium, um, Afghanistan, these are things that elicit something in our, our inner self. And I think what's happening with our imagery and the request for imagery, not necessarily the guys who want to know what NDVI is or EVI or those types of nerdy stuff around and stuff, but you can do really interesting urban planning or precision agriculture. But it, by flying over the, the planet like this with our imagery, you're able to evoke something much more rich, something that hits uh, our individuality. Um, you guys can go to our home page and kind of look at some of that stuff. Now, um, I think, uh, here, let's take that and put that on steroids. This is uh, Boston. Um, you can see the great green wall here. You can see traffic going. This is uh, our HD video coming down from space. Um, is unprecedented, uh, Ultra HD color imagery. What does this allow us to do? Anyone who wants to go deeper into that can come find me after this, but there are some amazing stuff that you can do from looking at situational awareness, macroeconomic economic indicators, um, and just the pure beauty of the, of the capabilities that we have now being able to take imagery from space like this is a uh, Pretty spectacular. Let me go show you a few more. Here is London. And now you'll see us straight some data visualization over it. This is the stuff that's powerful. This is the stuff that is uh, really where this data, this data shines and it can take us to places that we were not able to before.
Now, 5 meter resolution data, 1 meter resolution uh, video, uh, we acquired demos, uh, two satellites. We're starting to gain a lot of uh, capabilities with data. Some of the core to our being at EarthCast is um, a bit loftier than just the data itself. We're trying to solve and answer some questions about what makes us human and how we can solve some of our human uh, endeavors that are uh, pressing against us now. Uh, the ISS orbit is between 51 plus or minus degrees latitude. That is where most of us live on the planet. The ISS was purposely put into that orbit. These types of questions are going to start not only pressing on us, but haunting us here. And we'd like to stay ahead of us, ahead of that curve. Now here's the Amazon in 2000, and here's the Amazon in 2010. These are called fishbone roads. And these are, um, these roads are in Brazil. This is about uh, as good as it gets to illustrate how quickly the rainforest is being uh, deforested. What we're looking to do with things like SAR capabilities, SAR is Synthetic Aperture Radar. We're going to have a new sensor on the ISS on the American side um, with SAR and a new camera uh, that is 70 centimeters or better on the rest of the American side. And that allows us to see through canopies of trees. We can actually uh, see the ground and, and look at logging um, happening before it's going to actually appear as a fishbone road. That allows us to get ground truth prior to devastation like below happening. And that is a very powerful uh, uh, pitch that we are going to start working with NGOs like the UN, World Resources Institute, and many, many, many others that are interested in helping solve some of these, these problems that are facing us. To evoke that beauty, the, the flyover, the, it's a, called an overview effect. Some test pilots and astronauts have repeatedly experienced this in history where they feel detached from the, the Earth itself as they fly over an upper atmosphere um, and in orbit, uh, and have a sense of isolation but yet uh, attached to the beauty of the, the, the planet as a whole. We are now uh, helping operate HDEV, which is a, um, it was an experiment a while ago that was bolted onto the underbelly of the ISS, and now we can see forward-facing, rear-facing, in, in real, real, real time, uh, the horizon of the planet as the sun comes and goes. Um, so, but we have the, the HDEV sensor um, that uh, allows us to stream the horizon of the ISS uh, and as well as see some very beautiful sunrises and sunsets and we uh, ascend into um, darkness as well throughout the day. The ISS goes around every 90 minutes, so we get to see hurricanes below us to the Sahara and all kinds of things in the screen. If you haven't seen it already, it's pretty beautiful. Go to our, our, our website to check it out. Um, Now, some of the things that I'm responsible for in San Francisco um, is the uh, platform. The platform gets into how do we democratize this data. This type of data allows us to understand kind of our, it's the finger of, of humanity um, on the pulse of what's driving us to do what we do. We can look at... Uh, our atmosphere, uh, you can look at uh, things like um, precision agriculture, how do we feed ourselves, how do we look at floodplains, how do we um, look at war-torn areas, how do we monitor borders uh, for humanitarian relief. This spot on the earth is called Olduvai Gorge. Olduvai Gorge is um, in Tanzania, it's uh, the greatest fossil record that we have known to man about our evolutionary processes that have uh, happened throughout the millennia for 
human cobalt. What's cool about this spot is that it has such a rich and deep um, fossil record that that fossil record, coincidentally, every 200,000 years or so, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun changes a little bit. And every time that happens, our brain capacity actually gets bigger. Why does that happen? We don't quite know, but it's coincidentally things that push us to um, climate change and things like that that are reported in Old Dubai Gorge. At the same time, we, our tools get more sophisticated, our social capabilities get uh, greater, and our brain capacity, our compute capacity gets greater. This is a really perfect analogy of where we are in Earth observation, where we, we are in space uh, industries that are, it's the next leap in history right now. You guys can feel it, but you can't, you can't really put your finger on it. And this is what I think is happening quite a bit. Our platform is going to seek to create APIs that are scalable and rich in the metadata and imagery and video capabilities that allow you to build and innovate without having to create the entire image pipeline that you used to have to be an expert just to get to that point. It's almost the same thing as I needed to host a website, then I had to build a server, then I had to migrate to a co-location center. And now, if I just have that startup idea, I can just go to AWS. I can spin up what I need, I can spin it back down, or I can be smart about how I build my, my business around um, the econ economics around cloud hosting. That's where we're going with Earth Map. The platform is something that we don't necessarily focus on a map, putting imagery on a map, but it's the full value chain of getting data down from ephemeris and TLE data all the way down to predicting out um, forest fires or landslides or, or looking at the health of the uh, red belt in different countries. So the full suite of tools are built around a, a functionality that is going to respond to your business needs. We're not going to necessarily want to innovate on every single part of that value chain. We don't want to know what's coming down the road. We want you guys, the innovators, to leverage an operating system in order to do that. The applications that you can create are endless. And this is what we, we do. We also have some fascinating uh, amazing technology that can take you from the far right, um, true color, like RGB type imagery that you, you've seen for years on Google Maps to, with a click of a button, you can go look at water indices, which that's that uh, purple and magenta and blue. You can see that already that blue, that, that teal color, is straight up rivers going through, and you can see um, the, the water that's held within the soil. The next one over is uh, what's called false color NIR. This image allows us to see vegetation, vegetation health, um, and pinpoint where there's vegetation growth. And this next one over is called EVI, Enhanced Vegetation Index. And that allows us to see a, a different view of the world where we can see where things are growing and not. And we can tell a farmer that they should be uh, careful about over-nitrating to um, uh, over-watering, like especially in California where we have drought problems and things like that. All of this is usually done by experts, and now we have uh, abilities to do this on the fly. That's also unprecedented, what we are doing. So from the full going from space down to the data that you need to make decisions on the ground, we want to solve that that whole thing to get to that decision. The whole pipeline to make that decision possible, we want to solve it. So on the fly process of understanding your, your planet as it's changing, it changes so much every day. Video, uh, five meter resolution, one meter resolution data that we have now. Uh, 20 meter data, huge swaths of uh, vegetation health. What this allows us to do is not wait every six months, not wait every year to get reports compiled by experts. I mean, developers and, and uh, innovators can create something so meaningful weekly, daily. Um, and I think 
there are innovators in our space, Planet Labs, uh, Skybox, that are doing really powerful things to help unlock this. If this is fully unlocked, this is a Pandora's box that we open up that the world really has never had full access to this like, type of data. And by doing so, we, we're going to be allowing the world to actually understand the climate as it changes and the planet as it changes. So, for some examples, um, I did show you guys some at DBI, but this is a, a farm plot. Now you can see the red, um, this is post-harvest, that is showing what's healthy, still growing, or some vegetation on the border of that, but all of that has been harvested. Uh, we have our video, we can actually look at um, activity at ports to highways, things being constructed in China. Here's a manufacturing uh, plant, a um, coal plant in China. We all are also looking at automated change detection, um, integration with AIS data systems, car counting, all kinds of stuff. Now, there are some other innovators that have been here this week. We, we do have some guys that are doing some really amazing stuff, predicting PMIs, which is a Purchaser's Manufacturing Index, which looks at every six months or every year, um, several banks put out PMI indices to look at predicting out GDP. Now, if you could do that every week, that is something that you can actually take action or trade on. Um, that's a, that used to be reserved for governments or massive banks, and now we're going to start leveraging our data to be able to give that to the world. Sky's the limit. It really is uh, a, a powerful situation to be in now to uh, unlock this capability. Part of our loftier uh, aspirations was to work with NGOs and the UN. Uh, we have a relationship with the UN. Um, it runs fairly deep. Um, this application is how are we going to leverage um, our platform to integrate with Global Forest Watch, which our data comes in, it, it analyzes, it pushes data back out, and it helps look at near real time uh, forest health, net, net loss and net gain of forests. You can share that, you can follow a specific uh, spot of the earth. And where this comes into play is that there's commodities companies that uh, also want to come to the table and refine or, or better, uh, become better stewards of uh, their, their making of pulp, um, paper, wood products, what have you, and they're the, the end part of the, the force that's changing below it. Um, this is a powerful, powerful and evocative business case. It tells a story of a pub sub, like a, a push pool on an area of interest, and our entire platform has been based not solely on imagery. It's based on interacting with the area that you're concerned about programmatically. So we, we have an AOI, basically, pub-sub model that you can programmatically interact with imagery, uh, fire scar data, earthquake data, uh, first responder type data, and get imagery, push data requests in, tasking, preemptive tasking rights, and things like that. Um, it is a whole new way of looking at EO from the full value chain. This kind of evokes, for me, I, I come also from big data, web applications that um, help tell stories of brands and things like that. The digital agencies, broadcast media, uh, outdoor signage, all kinds of other things start eliciting maybe a need for some of this. We have announced a little while ago um, that we have now been asked to be the, the back-end power um, of the Pepsi Global Challenge. Usher is going to uh, be the main spokesperson of, of this campaign, but you can see where Earth observation data evokes a larger population that helps stand up different ideas that um, all the discrete ideas in itself are not as powerful as a, a larger global campaign. And having eyes coming down from space is a super powerful idea. That is where I want to put it back to you all, answer a couple questions, and I think there's so much done that I will kind of circulate and ask questions and answer some stuff for you guys as well. But I'll take a couple questions if you do want to do that.
Good question. We have three different streams. We have HDAC that's in, in real time, that's um, five seconds delay. Our MRC comes down and that's about six hour delay, up to six hour delay. Um, our HRC, depending on our high res camera, that has quite a bit of processing that we have to do. So that can take a, a few days to get that down. So it's not a stream per se, but we capture that and it can be uh, retrieved via API. Um, so we'll be unleashing some of our video APIs later next year. What are you and your partners in the city doing to reach out to the world to um, use the data? To use the data. What are you guys doing to just outreach to the world to get people to develop applications around the data? We, uh, when we first were founded, um, part of our, our uh, mandate on the web platform was to reach out to a population. We, we have about 200 some thousand people that have come to us, so we're not starting from scratch. And of those, we uh, refined the segmentation over time. We kind of discovered who would use this, and we invited several uh, thousand people to participate in our platform. And they're helping us define what they want, what, what they want to do with this. Uh, so everyone from first responders uh, to uh, analytics, predictive analytics, machine learning like this. Uh, yeah, so how it's going to work, um, our data is going to become available via APIs only right now. And we want to do that primarily because we don't want to force a paradigm on innovators. We, we don't want to put it in a context of a map. So you, if you want imagery, you can retrieve it in a certain way, and it's all fully documented on open standards. So we're not necessarily using something like OGC or things like that, but we use RESTful standards. You just program whatever it might be, a mobile device, a smartwatch, or whatever it might be. The idea is to access what you want out of that image. You don't have to buy the whole image anymore. We're going to shrink the, the form back. So you just are concerned about the AOI. So you can take that AOI and multiply it around the world and pay for the same thing you would have had to do for one image. And that's, that becomes a powerful situation for it. Analyst to a developer to a decision maker that you can monitor multiple places at the same cost as one place. I'm going to circulate. Yeah. What's the maximum amount of time you can be on a specific area? That's a good question. Great question. Um, our HRC, we flew out 45 degrees uh, plus and we go minus, and that's we're going around so fast that it's about uh, up to 90 seconds. Between 60 to 90 seconds is the ideal kind of uh, operating window. That's for you. Do you have any regulatory issues? Say again? Do you have any regulatory issues? Oh, lots. We can talk about that offline. In a gym, yes. There is um, a few regulator, regulatory bodies in the U.S. NOAA um, uh, is the primary one to get your operating license. You, you would go to DFAD in Canada. There's a few of them around the world. Um, it really uh, dictates what you're exporting or what you're selling. Uh, if you're operating satellites, you have to go to NOAA. If you're uh, selling data, you have to have another type of license. And you sometimes get takedown notices or re the government, most of the times the U.S. government asking us to delay or reduce quality of certain areas of the world. That's only happened once officially, but it does, it can happen. That's what it is. Again? resolution. It has to deal a little bit with re temporal resolution as well as the actual pixel resolution. Yeah? Uh, I, at this conference, we've heard from a lot of people who were doing various kinds of work observations. So I'm wondering how you're planning to deal with the glut of data that's going to be coming from competitors and, and how you're going to deal with the competitors. Can you repeat that one more time in the mic? Just so that people can hear you. Um, at, at this conference, we've heard from a lot of people who are doing various kinds of the imaging of observation. So I'm wondering how you're planning to deal with the glut of data that we're going to have about the planet and um, how you're going to address the competition in competitive aspects. That's a great question. Um, more the merrier, by the way. Um, we, we would not be in 
our place right now if there were not competitors jockeying for the place that helped us get to space. So the better solution for the right time in, in history, you're going to get the right image quality, you're going to get the right uh, capabilities, whatever that might be. It might have this advanced state of the art 18 months from now, that technology was not here when we built our stuff. So that's just a natural evolution of, of the industry. How we address our competitors, um, it's kind of like there, there's a room for three or four players in general for any big industry. And I think right now it's the Wild West and the best of breed will, will stick out. And we hope to stick out pretty, pretty far. Um, how we leverage our place in the industry, we are going to be working with the UN, NGOs, uh, and not necessarily where it used to be stuck in a DOD Intel community. That is, that, that's where we really want to shine. And I think where our competitors may or may not have that relationship with NASA and Roscosmos and the UN, I think that's where we, we will shine. Uh, but we can talk more about the ecosystem uh, growing. It's quite a big leap from uh, where we were a few years ago. I'll take a few more, circulate around. But thanks, you guys. I really appreciate you taking time with me. Our keynote speaker for lunch today is Dan Lopez, Vice President of Technology at EarthCast. He currently heads the building of EarthCast platform and web presence, focusing his digital cloud and engineering expertise on building products that are modern and open to democratize technologies with the aim of creating new markets. Please welcome Mr. Dan Lopez.
with the vision of putting a few sensors on the ISS uh, that are traditionally um, sent up in satellites. The form factor we shrunk down, uh, we removed a lot of the, uh, the overhead of having our own um, thrusters, form factor to be agile as a typical satellite would. Uh, now we have um, two sensors up there we launched about uh, two years ago. We um, took those up on a uh, Soyuz rocket. Uh, the two sensors are now banned on the uh, Svesda module on the Russian side, um, installing our cameras. <laughs> One of the coolest space selfies of all time is right there. <laughs> And obviously, pop culture was, uh, Sergey was well aware that taking a selfie from space is probably going to be one moment in history here. Um, since then, uh, we have now taken our cameras, and they are now aloft on the ISS. The arm here that you can see in the top right uh, of the screen, that is a device that was uh, developed uh, from MDA, uh, McDonald Dive Alert, uh, in Canada. They're the premier. Space, um, space guys in, in Canada, they built the Command Arm 1 and 2, and now Command Arm 3, which uh, holds our camera. The big bolus thing here at, at the end of the uh, arm is a biaxial pointing platform, um, and that allows us to shallow out and follow a target on the ground.